Well, welcome to another episode of Digging for the Truth. I tell you what, we have an incredible episode for you today. In fact, it's going to be two episodes. I've got two ladies here I cannot wait for you to meet. They are mighty women of the kingdom of heaven, and they have a passion in their heart for a heavy subject, and it's the human trafficking, sex trafficking going on. So I'll tell you what, I can't wait to introduce you. Talk, talk to you in a sec. Well, welcome. Um, I have two special ladies, but we have one here in the studio with us today, and that is Miss Reba Russell. And so anyway, I cannot wait to introduce you to Reba, but we also have another one um, here online with us, and that is Toya. We're going to get to both of them, but I will tell you what I'd like to do, Reba, since uh, I've got you here in studio. Um, I'd like for you to uh, just tell us a little bit about yourself, you know, who you are and how you got into this. Okay, well, I am the executive director over Total Freedom Ministries, and it's founded on Isaiah 61, healing the brokenhearted and setting the captives free. And essentially what we've done in the ministry since 2008 is counsel and minister to the brokenhearted, to the most severe level of yeah. traumatic um, experiences. Um and I also am an author. I've written two children's books, and I've been in the journey of writing a no novel. And through that novel, which is going to be talking, it's going to be making awareness of the child sex trafficking um, just subject that has just become an epidemic. And so I started doing more research yeah. and realized how big and how huge this is, oh, yeah. and also backtracking and realizing so many of the women that I had ministered to over the years, some of them were being sex trafficked, and I didn't even realize what that term was in that time frame. So, well, yeah. well, I'll tell you what, I, I've talked just... <laughs> I've talked to several, we had several conversations, so I, I first spoke with you, uh, we ran into each other at church, um, and you kind of told me what was going on, I was like, oh my gosh, I've got to have you on, and then that led to several other conversations, and, and so actually, I'm not exactly how the two of you connected, but I know for a fact, you connected me to Toya, so I'd like to introduce Toya Kaplan, would you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and, and how you got into this ministry? I'd be happy to, and thank you, first of all, for having me. Um, any chance we get to talk about this conversation, it is so important to me personally, because it's what I'm doing with my life. Mm -hmm. um, we actually started this about eight years ago, and I initially had a home um, called Freedom House, and I am the founder and director of, that was initially Freedom House, but now for the one and vulnerable no more. Um, so we are actively preventing sex trafficking by going to the very people that need to hear about it. Those who are um, the ones that predators are looking for and trying to traffic and for everybody else in the community that needs to know about it. So they're not vulnerable and they can help these young people not to fall prey. Well, you know, when we were talking the other day, uh, Toya, you, you brought something up that I think that is where we just need to start. And that is um, why you do what you do, um, because this is a, a serious I, I, just in our conversations leading up to this podcast today. I've learned a lot um, and it's more serious than and I knew it was serious, but it's even more serious than, than I realized. Um, and I think that your why is a great kind of foray into this. You mind sharing that with us? Um, absolutely be glad to and I want to back up just one second to say that we talked about initially how this entire conversation is like drinking from a fire hose yeah. I mean it is an intensely involved multi-level multi-layered conversation it so we just want to take a breath if you if you catch me um, talking like more pronounced and carefully I've asked God to slow me down um, I'm hyperactive and I don't want people to miss the key things here. So I wanted to start with that and then I'll go ahead and tell you that as I trained to open our home, Freedom House, um, when we traveled to different organizations, we went to different um, residential programs across the United States, 
I began to make a correlation between my own history and the abuse in my past. And Reba and I had a very, um, our initial conversation was that we have a lot in common. We have a history of abuse in our past. And as I drew the line uh, from what made me vulnerable growing up, from four years old when I was first sexually abused and all the way through my life, um, which then eventually caused me to be somebody that started using drugs at a young age. Um, I just was self-medicating um, at every opportunity. That made me vulnerable to controlling people who then would drug me um, at whatever event or a party or whatever I was at. And I started to look at the vulnerabilities of these women, children, boys and girls who are being trafficked. And then eventually the women in our own residential home, Freedom House, um, as I got to know them better and I heard their stories, I began to understand that all those vulnerabilities are the reason why predators were able to find them, groom them, recruit them, and eventually sex trafficking them. So I heard God say to me in a meeting, just for the one, for the one you can help. You can't look at all these multiple numbers. Reba and I have talked over mm -hmm. and over, and you did too the other day, Trent, uh, about even misrepresented numbers right now because it's so underreported. Um, our concern is that people will say, well, it's only over there. It's only in other countries. It's only because the borders are open now rather than it could be my next door neighbor. It could be my hairdresser's daughter. It could be my cousin. There's, it needs to become personal. And so we, we talked about how we need to start thinking about that. So anyway, um, I heard for the one. So all these things are happening to all these people, but who can we help? Who can Reba help? Who can Trent? Who can the people that are listening to this right now, who can you help that's in your sphere of influence? And so For the One is the name of our organization. And my why is because I don't want one more child to go through what I did growing up. And I was not sex trafficked, but I can tell you I was taken advantage of over and over and over again. And still I got born again, September 7th, 1980. And that day I realized that I was the one, you know, that Jesus died for me I, for the yeah. one was Toya that day. So that's what we are. We're for the one and we're doing vulnerable no more to expose, um, what these traffickers are doing and what these predators are doing to control and take charge of our children's yeah. and our young adults' lives. I'm so glad that I'm so glad that you listened to the father um, and that it was something that you stepped up and that you decided that hey, I'm I'm going to do something about this. Um, both of you ladies are passionate <laughs> and and y'all are absolutely um, gifted in the areas of just the spirit and and, and where God has sent you. When we started talking about this, so you, you're right. Um, just the conversations we had was me like drinking out of a, a fire hose. Um, and I've had time to process it. So I want to start with this first thing, and that is it's a real problem. It's really going on. It's an issue right here, not only, you know, in our country or our state, but our community. It is literally everywhere. And I think a lot of people just need to understand that this is a real problem and, and we need to open our eyes, just like, uh, you know, when Saul was on the road to Damascus and the scales fell, fell from his eyes after Ananias prayed for him and he had an encounter with Jesus. I think we need some road to Damascus moments um, in regards to human trafficking. I mean, what are your thoughts on that, Reba? Um, yeah, I think we've just got to realize that right here in the U.S. alone, 2.5 million in a, uh, are, are being bought in the sex trade right now, children are being That's sex insane. trafficked. That's insane. Um, but of course, just like Toy and I talked about, these are just the numbers that are being reported because yeah. it is just beyond that. But my question is, who are buying these children for sex? Well, I, I want to get to that exactly. Yeah. Well, and and, and y'all both have said this. I mean, you know, one, who is it? How's it being facilitated? Yes. Um, you know, how do people even, you know, fall into this? Okay, both from a, you know, a, the, those who are the victims, but also those who are pursuing them. Mm -hmm. And then 
not on this episode. So we're, I promise we're going to get to the good stuff on episode two in regards to what we can do and how we can get plugged in. But I think it's important that we understand the problem. And, and so let's do that. So first of all, you know, you gave a little bit a minute ago to you about how people fall into this, but I think we need to start there. It's real. And it's not always, you said something the other day that I think we need to talk on in my head. When I, you tell me sex trafficking, I always think, well, it's all these people that have been kidnapped. But y'all, I believe it was you, Toya, that mentioned that that's actually just a, a smaller percentage than you would think. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yes, and um, because we will never have exact statistics on that, I just want to say that if you're looking at a scale where um, this would be those that are kidnapped and, and more representative, like of the movie Taken, for example, um, if you have this exponential incline to up here where if that's maybe 3%, for example, 97% as just an example of those young boys, girls, men and women, they are not the ones that are kidnapped. They're the ones who are spotted, recruited and groomed either in public places or online. It's so much more prevalent online right now um, which I'm sure Reba Absolutely. also could agree with that. Mm -hmm. And you, actually you, Trent, also you get how, because the use has increased so much, um, especially during COVID, of our young people being on these computers all the time. Um, it's, I say, it's like shooting fish in a barrel. It is so much easier for these predators to get to our kids now and to traffic them. So they're still doing it in person. Um, they are certainly still um, occasions where somebody is kidnapped. So we're not asking you to forget about that, no, no. to not keep your kids safe. We, it still happens. That is the bolder group though, because they, these predators, when I say they, these traffickers, recruiters and predators, they have learned and they think they're businessmen. We talked about that the other day. They believe they're running a business as if these were not human lives that they're ruining because they don't care. No, it's just a commodity, um, a looking, product of them. Yeah. They, they don't see the human at all. hundred percent, hundred percent. Your, your child, your relative, your friend, whoever it is, is, is like a pizza to them, a commodity. And it's certainly a living thing, but they're looking at what is the best way that we can most easily recruit and control these young people and young adults. But, and I say that because even though there's some older people that are trafficked, all of our people that we got in Freedom House were children when they were first recruited and first trafficked. Um, and as an example, uh, the first woman we got was five years old when they started grooming her. Oh, wow. She's Native American and her family uh, groomed her and prepared her. And at 13, well, I live in Albuquerque. I, I, you just glossed over something. I think you, you said something that, uh, I, did you say her family did? Her family groomed her? Yeah, and like I said, it's a fire hose. We, where we live in Albuquerque, are seeing an exponential growth in familiar trafficking. And it is largely to, to um, or because we have such a high level of, um, addiction and yeah. so and poverty so a lot of these families are selling their children for that reason um the the woman i spoke about um she when we got her finally she was 40 and had been sold at 13 after re being wow. recruited at five she's lived her whole life on central which is route 66 here in albuquerque it's old route 66 she's been sold on that her entire life since she was 13. Um, so uh, what I'm saying, yes, families are recruiting, strangers are recruiting, your your children's friends at school, some of them are recruiting. So, so um, I think that, that's, a, a I th I think that's an important point we need to talk about. So in, in Amarillo, so I know of several cases, um, one of them had to do with, and, and this is the other thing that a lot of people don't realize, and this was an opening one for me, um, in this particular case, it was a group, um, it was a girl that actually recruited another girl. Um, and it was a slow process. This was something that took place over six, eight months, nine months. It began where she would just go in and she saw, I guess they, I, and, and you'll probably both have a, something, but they look for people who are vulnerable. And I think we yes. need to talk about what those vulnerabilities are here in just a second. But they picked these vulnerabilities out. 
And so this girl would go into this um, uh, earring and something shop. And she was leery at first, but, you know, after so many times her coming in as a deal out the mall, then they eventually, she did their friends on Facebook. And then they, well, one day um, the, the girl, uh, the, the predator, asked the victim, hey, me and my boyfriend are going to a concert. And the, the, the girl had a check. She's like, I don't know. The girl's mother encouraged her and said, I'll watch the baby if you want to go. So they get in, they give her a sonic cup, had something in it. She was out. She woke up. They're nearly to Dallas. And they said, all right, you work for us for the next three years. You got, you know, you have to work this much. And, and I mean, what's crazy, she got saved on a sting operation. And there's a whole lot of other details. But what's crazy, when she, they got her out of it, uh, for the first, is an in, a very intensive in-house program. For the first six out of the nine months, she still said it was her fault. She, it was the shame. Right. So, so she took all, all these, they, she was a victim, but she thought it was all her fault. So first, is, is this is a common thing, I'm guessing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. The yes. trickery and, um, and, and even with women. Uh, we've got to train our kids to be careful with women that are coming in and trying to traffic and, and groom and recruit. And there's the hook and bait of all of that, or the, the bait and hook, that is. But... Um, but I had a young lady that uh, something, a similar situation happened with her as well. But it's very common, and, and we've got to train our kids. This isn't to bring uh, stuff out to, to make it heavy on our parents and to make parents feel hopeless or put fear in their hearts. All of this is to empower the parents yes. so they can empower the children so that they can be watchful of this kind of stuff. And so many women that do come out of this, and, and I know a lot of the women that I've ministered and men, of course, and counseled, they do come out of situations of chronic abuse feeling mm. like it is their fault. There is such shame attached to this. Well, that's what the enemy does. I mean, yeah. the accuser of the brethren. Mm. First, he'll, he'll in, this, this, in many cases here, these young people weren't convinced through temptation into it. They were forced into it. Mm -hmm. And then he still shows up and shames them. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. so let's, let's back up for a minute. So I want to, I want to talk about those vulnerabilities. Okay. So these predators and, and predators, as you mentioned just a minute ago, could even be family, which that's a whole nother thing. So let's just put that one on the shelf for a second. Um, let's say that, you know, you've got these kids, um, you know, the average teenager now, they, they, the very first thing they do before they even get out of bed is actually look at their phones. First of all, if you have a teenager, I'm going to go ahead and say a little pl plug here. Don't let your kids have their phones in their bedroom at night. It needs to be on a counter downstairs. But anyway, um, I digress. But these, that's the first thing they do. They have an average of roughly, you know, nine hours of screen time, okay, in, in a day. That's insanity. Think about how much time that is. Okay, so there, there's all these things, you know, that are coming in front of them. And that means they're probably encountering a ton of people. Toya, you, you, I'm going to put a link. Um, but to, I want you to tell the, uh, the video that you sent and I'm going to, y'all both sent me so many links. What we're going to do is take all these links and put them in the description. So that way people can have access to all of them. But would you tell us about that video? I thought it was a great illustration. It is because um, people are not realizing that, and I have my computer open right now, but the, this video, and we see so much, you can imagine as an organization, I watch so much stuff. Mm -hmm. This one stood out. Um, it's a group in Canada uh, put it together and they, showed a mom is cooking in the kitchen a daughter's on her laptop in her bedroom and it's basically just showing these men coming into her bedroom right through the door right right through the front door right up the stairs right into the bedroom um and the i think the most um just tragic but really effective moment in the whole video is when one of those predators leans forward and says basically let me see and he wants to see her, you know, yeah. under her shirt. Well, and first, he just, just complimented me. her, though. You're just so pretty and yeah. so talented yeah. and played on that, yes. right? And, and, I mean, truthfully, right. when I saw it, it made me sick. But, honestly, this is exactly yes. what's going on. Okay, yes. so. Yes, and in every online case um, with that type of grooming, they're going to start with what appears to be a very simple compliment. Uh, you are so gorgeous. And there's a quick shift from that to, Either you should be famous or your parents don't appreciate you enough, depending on what the child is saying online and how they're dressing, which we talked a lot about that. One of the vulnerabilities they're looking for is 
neediness in a child uh, or a young adult. And to be honest, the more skin somebody shows, and that's not to say you have to be frumpy or whatever dressed, but the more skin somebody shows online, that is somebody that is begging for attention. Um, mm -hmm. Those that are complaining out uh, loud about their parents and how unfair everything is it's another thing that they see as a vulnerability so it's as if it's a shark in the water looking for blood and, yeah. and honestly and i've heard it from both our female recruiters who started off being trafficked and became recruiters we can talk about that later they say they know exactly what they're looking for online and with their friends that they know in school they're looking for those vulnerabilities a needy child somebody a needy young adult and you show you're needy when you're online and you present yourself as a needy person well, so um ab absolutely they're going to jump right on that and throw a bait out uh, reba that's it's good for you to talk about that the, the bait and hook yeah. aspect um what were you were saying there toya about um something that god was just showing me today as we were talking and, and we've been talking through all of this is that these online predators are looking at profiles and they are profiling your children mm -hmm. and so Good. we need to yep. realize they are literally coming in here and i looked up what profiling means and um, i'm not going to read it you can go look it up but it's it is exactly what they're doing because they are master manipulators. They know what yes. they're doing. And like you said, Toya, this is a business to them. And so we need to, I, I love that video that you sent. Are you going to be showing that? Trend? Well, it's, it's, I'm gonna, it's going to be in the description below. Okay. Honestly, and I kind of did that on purpose. Um, some of the things that, that we're showing, like that one, honestly, there's, there's, we're talking about heavy stuff, so obviously, you know, probably this is not the episode for all ears to be hearing because we're talking at a higher level. Now, that right. doesn't mean that we don't need to be talking about and educating our children and, and letting them know there are bad people out there that want to do bad things. Um, but anyway, I am going to put this link in there. When I watched it, honestly, I was like, it, it made me, I mean, mm -hmm. it made me angry, but it was it, it, it was a heavy video. Yeah. Um, and it was yeah. only about 30 it's seconds. Terrifying. But it, it is terrifying. Yeah, but it, it's, it's set a really... It, it kind of it's in 30 seconds is a great way to make you realize what's coming in and out the traffic you are the gatekeeper of your home when you do not protect your child on that device which we're going to talk about that on this next episode but when you don't protect that child on that device then you are literally inviting in the enemy and so um so reba you, you when we were talking earlier you said something that i thought was interesting and i'd like for you to share the statistics it has to do with the one about the football stadium and how many people just to get a number about how many children or people, not just children, people are being trafficked here. In this, now, this was the United States, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you can't, there's no way that you can have a reliable uh, number, number yeah. on it. But, of course, um, I looked up on the, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, and they say that every year there's over 400,000 children that are reported missing. There is a high percentage of those children that are being trafficked. Um, there's another site that I saw, and it's 800,000 children that are missing. So, I mean, it's, I think it's it's, nobody broad, knows. It's such a broad range. Yeah. And, um, and we think, oh, well, it's just other children in other countries. No, this is in the United States alone. And... You know, I mentioned a while ago about one of the one of the things that I read was in the United States, adults purchase children for sex at least two point million times a year. And my question was, who is doing that? Who is purchasing them? And I I looked up some stuff in Veterans for Child Rescue. They had some answers on that. What, what, what were they saying? Okay, they were talking about otherwise ordinary men and, and yes, women. But one of the things that they said was there's two types of pedophiles. There's the gutter pedophile and there's the elite pedophiles. And Toy, I'm sure you know this. But the elite pedophiles are those in position of authority, community, respect, and otherwise high-functioning individuals. It's people that you would trust your children with. Well, and, and one yeah. of those, real quick, I, I just, so one of those, um, so I remember we used to watch the show 19 Kids and Counting, 
Okay, and they had, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a large family, and they're a Christian family, and there's things I agreed with, things I didn't agree with, but the, the oldest child, Josh Duggar, he's, he's in prison now uh, for child pornography, you know, and he did a whole bunch of other bad stuff in regards to, you know, it um, doesn't matter, we don't get into it, but then, but here's the thing is that I, I don't, I, I don't understand how somebody gets there. I mean, now I know that I think this is the whole thing it goes back to vulnerability. How many people are being trafficked? You talked about the elites, and I want to hear the other as well. But I also want to know, like, how do you get there? I think it's the, if unrepentant sin begets more sin. Enough is never enough. I assume that's how you get to this, that get that elite. Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah. or any of them, I guess. I don't know. Well, right, I just, and you, um, you can't. You can't. Sorry. Go ahead, Toya. Go ahead, Toya. Go ahead. I just wanted to throw in, and you can, you may have numbers on this over there, Reba, but pornography is the big driver of all mm -hmm. of this. Oh, and absolutely. People can, they can be defensive if they want to, but it's the truth. So, well, sorry. You don't Go have ahead, to be Reba. defensive, but on that point, and we need to finish this bit on pornography. Okay. When Bill Clinton was in office, he actually had signed a bill that he was, I mean, that, that to actually outlaw pornography because the internet was becoming prolific, okay? And it was overruled by a single federal judge. It shows you that this is something that is serious. So George W. Bush, everybody, so I'm not just picking on the Democrats, let's pick on the Republicans for a minute. George W. Bush, he was in office. And they brought to him, said, okay, listen, pornography is so bad online, we need to do something about this. So what if we go ahead and we just say that only pornography can exist on a .xxx subnet, Okay, or another word, or subdomain, okay? So whatever it is, .xxx. Do you know how much easier it would be to restrict any flow of, of pornographic images? Well, he signed off, he, 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 he vetoed it, okay? He vetoed it because he said it didn't want to create a red light district online. Well, let me tell you something. The whole thing, you know, there's a thousand new websites, porn websites coming online every minute. Yeah. Okay, you can't even keep up with it anymore. And, and so, yes, pornography is absolutely vile and evil, and we're going to give you some solutions as to what you can do in your home to help prevent this. And if you're struggling with pornography and you have an addiction, we're going to talk about that too. But it will lead you, enough is never enough, it will lead you into more depraved things. That's just the nature of it. Go read Romans. It talks about that God gave them over to a depraved mind because they could not, they turned their backs on God for, for lust. And so anyway, yeah. we have the elitists. Okay, and that's, I mean, people, positions of wealth and power, which even more is going to be upon their head. Then what's the other group? Well, the other group is just otherwise ordinary people. And then, of course, you can you can put that probably in the category. And then you talk about the gutter pedophiles, which, you know, those could be gang members. Who knows? The M6, what is it called? The Oh, yeah, the, the, the gangs, yeah. M MS-13. MS-13 gangs, All of yeah. that. I mean, but but I think we all want to just put them in the gutter uh, on the – in the gutter, you know, section, but no, there, there's many of them otherwise, but what's happening, and I know Toya and I were talking about that, that pornography is, is what it's doing, it's creating new appetites, and they're just sicker appetites, and it's eroding the fabric of our civilization and our culture. There's, there's no question. It's literally eroding it, and what's happening is I was reading that, um, that child export, Ex child exportation and rapes on unregulated big porn sites such as Pornhub. They have no age verifications. I think there's some laws trying to be set in to set that. But this is criminal by nature. There are child, uh, there is child rape infested on porn sites right now. And um, oh, absolutely, what, it, yeah. what it begins to do, and, and I think people need to realize, because we don't want to, um, we don't want to um, look down on people that are struggling this, with this. We want right. to call them up. Right, right. And, absolutely. Yeah. And so we're going to say, you're, yeah. you're stronger than that, because what it says in, in Proverbs, that uh, the seductive spirit reduces a man to breadcrumbs. Mm. And so it pulls the strength out of a man. It devalues a woman. Um, and, it, and you can't separate porn and child sex trafficking. They both overlap. Well, and then what you're doing is you're feeding the very monster. And I know there's a lot of people that... Um, that they can say they're against sex trafficking, but you can't. If be. you're pursuing pornography, you're supporting yeah. it. Yeah, 
Exactly. Well, here's an interesting right. number, the statistic that came out. Right. Okay, so they every year, the porn, the porn websites, they reveal how many hours of pornography um, are viewed, okay? Mm -hmm. This last year, the largest porn website, they released the statistics. Do you want to take any guess how many years worth of, of pornography were watched? Mm -hmm. 500,000 years of pornography were watched in a single year. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a number you can't even wrap your head yeah. around, okay? And, and I want to say this to, to the men. Because you think, well, you know, I'm just looking at something, and it's not that big a deal. Let me tell you, first of all, if you, if you know God, first, I have compassion for you if you struggle. The temptation in this world is insane. Yes. Okay? Yeah. So first, let me say that before I, I call you out. <laughs> and then as she said, Reba told me, it call you up. But, but the thing is, first, you have to be mm -hmm. a man, and you have to hold yourself accountable. If you say that you're a man of God, and you struggle in this area, there's so many people, and there's a lot of good resources we'll give you later as, as far as pursuing it. But first of all, when you do this, you know, not only are you, you know, you know, betraying God, but you're also betraying your spouse. And, and, and let me tell you something. You know, one of the things I pray every single day is that, that I would have eyes only for my bride, only have eyes for my mm -hmm. wife. And, and let me tell you, it's a struggle. I don't care who you are and how godly of a person you think you are. I get it. It's a struggle. But you have to make a decision. And if you thought about this, that you knew that when you were looking at pornography, and let's say that you have a daughter or a small child, and you knew that by you viewing that, it was going to put them in that industry. It changed the way you think about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, because it's driving the demand. Absolutely. Well, it is. It's driving the demand. Yeah. So let's shift gears just a little bit. Um, everybody thinks this is somebody else's kid. You know, this is happening to the – and I mentioned this, and, and Toya, you, you, you mentioned this when we were talking um, offline – I had made a statement about just all of the children, girls and boys, especially between certain ages coming across the water, how they are being taken advantage of. And, and we can all agree. And I know it's bad, and I know it exists, and we can talk about that. But you said something that really struck me. And you said, yes, that's true. But it's also happening to the kids right next door. And I'll, it's important that we understand, yes, this isn't just at the border problem or in another country problem, but it's a problem here. You mind elaborating on that a little bit? Oh, absolutely. And I almost feel um, because I never want to disregard any human life. Oh, I, and I, I want to make sure to acknowledge that no matter where it's happening, it's horrible. But my own um, beginnings in this was that I was concerned about the children in Moldova. I didn't think for a second, it didn't click on me, you know, 15 years ago when my my girls, I had three daughters that were around the same age as it, of those girls that were coming from Moldova with the ministry. Um, I didn't realize that it happened beyond these other poor countries, oh, poor countries that they're dealing with that. Well, God just took that seed. And the more I just began to even barely research it, the more I found out just how prevalent it is here. And opening the borders and having all these children that are coming across without parental supervision is devastating, devastating. And don't think for a minute, you both know this, don't think for a moment that that's not uh, causing a huge influx uh, to meet uh, the need or feed this monster that we already have oh, here product. in the U.S. They're, they're, they're shipping so, product across that border. Yeah. Yeah. It in is, but we've in, got... In this terminology, yeah. Correct, but I, I will say that that one of our survivors that we had, and we've known her for years now, um, she uh, was a student here in Albuquerque. Um, she was a very good student, and when she was 17, um, somebody ended up that was a girl in her life was the recruiter that drew her into this. They were, um, had she had gone through a divorce with her mom and dad, they had a lot of issues financially. And the friend, the recruiter that was female said, um, you know, all you have to do is be on these, these men's arms. You, you know, they just want a beautiful girl to be with them and you'll make all this money. And, you know, she, she really dampened it down. Well, in no time, of course, that young lady ended up being uh, trafficked. And then I will share part B to that. And the, the same trafficker that entered this young woman's life also was the trafficker of a young lady we ended up getting. They didn't know each other, the one in Seattle, Washington, and the one that was here locally in Alabama. Albuquerque. They did not know each other, but they shared the same trafficker. So these, these organizations or individuals ha that have this business strategy 
they go across borders. They, um, they rarely stay in one state and they are doing it in our own backyards. It is in our neighborhoods. It's, there's brothels that are in neighborhoods currently. Um, if you can drive up to a motel room and walk in that door, that motel is going to have all kinds of sex trafficking happening at it. Um, I, you well, couldn't that, pay that me a million for, dollars girl, to stay there. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. Have a delay. No, go ahead. Um, that girl, I want, I, let's talk on that. So we in the news, if you if y'all haven't noticed or, or didn't see it recently in the news, there was a, a girl down, with her, a 15-year-old girl at a, a Mavericks game with her dad, went to the bathroom, disappeared, Okay. And it was, uh, it was, oh my God, it's horrible. The, the police, the police never even filed a report. I mean, every, well, it's really not our jurisdiction, whatever. And it was a Christian organization that uh, attacks and fights um, human trafficking. The founder, 10 days later, just as you said, Toya, okay, it was in a hotel. They found her in a hotel in, in, and what, what was amazing to me in this, when they, there's eight people they arrested of the eight, Six of them were women. I know. I noticed that too. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that insane? Yeah. And so that, we think, okay, no, well, but I'm that's, gonna trust. We need to know it. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, you know, it's easier in, in the world that I grew up in um, <laughs> when it was it made more sense, I guess. I mean, women were definitely more trustworthy. Uh, you know, in that area, like if you're talking about sex, I mean, generally you didn't think, oh, well, women are going to be in the middle of that. Well, now there, I mean, there's there's no delineation between men and women i mean we know that just from other areas that we see demonically being you know attacked i mean as far as gender and stuff in the world so but it's just insane to me uh, how vulnerable so that you mentioned something and you weren't quoting that you knew something but you said something i never thought of toya until we talked the other day about that case and that was that that girl might have been talking to somebody else online and just happened to connect with them at the game and they're not sharing those details right now. So um, I'm still trying to, and I sent you what I found right. on my end. We're trying to find it out, but really because of the research that we're doing that adds to our events that we're and our curriculum we're creating um, to gift to parents and people that need to know this information, we're trying to figure out, did she at some point, was this that little 3% maybe of full on kidnapping? Or, which is more likely, did he connect with her online and did he recruit her in? And frankly, he may have sent a girl first, um, a girl from his stable, which is what we call the group of women that they control, um, is probably somebody that he's been trafficking for years, but she's raised up through the ranks and becomes a woman in a, a position of authority. And she's going to be the one that goes talks to these young girls. Uh, mm -hmm. Most most girls have some sort of a, and I would say for me, it'd be like Holy Spirit going, no, yeah, but they exactly. have some sort of sense of, of, of concern and fear and something's wrong. If a man comes to them, um, even somebody closer to their age and starts talking this stuff, you get somebody around their age to come and talk to them and you bet that's a, a much easier to recruit somebody. And on a bigger scale, we saw that Epstein, Epstein Jeffrey Epstein, oh, yeah. sent his girlfriend, he sent her to initially get the girls and the girls that came, he recruited them back into the schools to, or sent them back into the schools to recruit more girls. These are businessmen who it's occurred to them that they get more girls if they send a woman to recruit them so yeah it's huge and this maverick or excuse me that i guess i can say that yeah. it's it's public that the maverick story um i suspect and i could be wrong that she got online and maybe thought she was talking to somebody around her age you know that was a girl or a guy that found, that said you're so beautiful and um maybe talked to her for a couple of weeks or so and found out she was going to this game and he's like you want to travel? I can take you anywhere. I can make you famous. Do you want to sing? I've heard you sing. You're so good. Come with me. I'll, we'll meet at the Mavericks game. Tell your dad you're going to the bathroom and we'll meet. And and then boom, gone, you know, uh, that fast. And they well, found her in they, Oklahoma they saw City. Video, so they did find video on that where they, she was leaving. Yeah. They She was leaving the building with somebody. And so if, if she was really didn't, in my opinion, and I never dawned on me. I was like, well, how'd they keep your sound? Well, that, that would make sense. Or they threatened. I thought, well, maybe they threatened, we'll kill your dad, or we'll do, I don't know. I just, who knows? 
Yeah. But, you know, there, there are so many different ways. After that, we went to a sod poodle game here in Amarillo, and I have them with my girls and stuff, and I'm standing outside the door. I'm making a mean old face. I'm gonna, I was like looking at everybody. I said, you look at my daughter the wrong way, I'm going to kill you. You know? Um, yeah. Anyway. So, anyway. Yeah. So, let, let's, let's kind of start, you know, we talked about the vulnerabilities. We talked about online. We talked about, you know, what's feeding and what in this appetite. And this is horrible stuff. And you said something a while ago. I never even don't, never even thought about it. Brothels and neighbor, neighborhoods. I mean, uh, you just don't know. It's it's. I think that it's everywhere. It's absolutely insidious. There's we, this this entire our entire society has been hypersexualized. You know, and and think about it. I mean, all this drag stuff, gay stuff, trans stuff. It's a hundred percent about. They say gender. No, it's a hundred percent, one hundred percent about sex. And and yeah. so. Yeah. You know, people just the, – the enemy, Satan, he wants to go and he wants to attack the identity. That's, that's, what, he, that's what he did in the garden. He, he, he attacked Adam and Eve in the garden and immediately attacked the identity of, of how God created them, male and female. And from that moment forward, I mean, we've been struggling in, in the area of sex. And so it's just now, you know, the two – I always say the two worst things that ever happened to society is live TV and the Internet. And I'm in the, you know, I'm in the technology business. And if I was made, you know, king of the world and I could pull the plug, I would. But it's here to stay. And so we have to learn how to navigate these waters, which is what I'd like to get to here pretty quick. And, and, but before we close this episode, I, I wanted to, to just kind of talk. You mentioned something, um, and really this kind of pertains to the next episode. But before we get into how to solve it, I want to mention, you, you, we're talking, and you talked about you went on a mission trip to Nicaragua mm -hmm. and something happened that you know and this is this kind of to me is the whole vulnerability thing how they're preying on people I have a story about my wife two men you know trying to get her you know in, in the store and I tell you what if I got my hands on those guys I, I love Jesus but I'm gonna rip their arms off but tell that story I thought this is important we need to have our head on a swivel yeah, I think it's just so vital that we walk in that situational awareness. Oh, yeah. And um, at that point, I did not realize just the epidemic that was here in the U.S., but we, were, we went to Nicaragua on a mission trip, and um, we were coming back home. I got on the plane, and the plane was packed full. And um, I was in the center seat. There was a gentleman that sat beside me on the aisle seat. But I already noticed when we were getting on the plane, these two men. One of the men was a, um, a, about probably five or six seats ahead of us. And, then the, and I knew these two gentlemen were together. But just something, I think that's what we need to realize. We've got to listen to our inner alarm. I think, Toy, you said that. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, really just letting the Holy Spirit lead in that discernment. And I was watching this guy. And there was another uh, mission group, a mission trip. You could tell it was a youth group that all were in the very back of the plane. They were further back than our group. So we knew there were two different, probably, youth groups, uh, church groups. And, um, but everybody had gotten on the plane and there was no one else boarding. And all of a sudden, one young girl, she was cute as she could be. She's probably about 13, 14 years old. And she comes running on the plane. Well, I didn't realize, but she was with that particular uh, youth group in the very back. Well, the man up front looked at the man sitting beside me. They cued each other. The man sitting beside me leaned over and took a picture of her. Oh, my gosh. And let me tell you, I wanted to do something. Oh, yeah. Mama Bear rose up. and uh, But I sat there. I fumed on that plane the whole time. I was praying and asking God, how do I handle this? What do I do? And so I knew what he was telling me. When we started deboarding the plane, right there where people are – that they have to check off their check out, you know, they check off their luggage right there. They were waiting, so I waited there, and I waited, and that young girl got off the uh, deboarded first before the rest of the group, and I grabbed her and I said, "Sweetheart, I said, who are you with?" 
And she told me who she was with, and I told her, I said, don't move. Stay right here with me. Praise Jesus for and you, And so ma'am. she stayed there, and they, the others were getting off the plane, and I, I asked to her, I said, who is head of your group? And it was a youth leader, and I told him the situation. Of course, he, his chest bowed out, and he was like, okay, where are they? And I told him, I said, I'll point them out if I see them. But watch her. Do not take your eyes off of her. I have no clue what they were planning on, but it was not good. And so we were we were uh, uh, in the line where you just, uh, the roped off area, and they were about three ropes ahead of us, these two men. And what was interesting, I thought, was that God put our group together in this mission, this other mission group together. Yeah. So I hollered at the, the youth pastor over there, and I said, those are the two men. Or first, I, I told our pastor and youth pastor at that time, and they were like, where is he? I pointed out, and then I but got, you, But this is the part, you, you yeah, yelled, so you yeah, knew they could hear. Yeah, I got the attention of the youth leader, and I yelled it out so that those other two men could hear me. And I said, those are the two men who took her picture. And, I mean, you had all these men around that were just glaring them down. Good. And so they tucked tail and left. But, I mean, it was about, I mean, that happens right here though in the U.S. But I think what's yep. important for moms and dads yeah. and parents, I mean, I didn't have my own kids, but that's that's something for people to realize. You don't have to, your children may be grown, but you need to be aware. You need to be watchful for the other child out there that is vulnerable. Well, I want to say this. First of all, you, we're going to talk about this here in just a minute. We're going to start talking about what you can do because let me tell you something, your voice is powerful and you cannot be silent. Let me tell you, it's time to get off the fence. You know, there's evil all around you, and you either are going to be consumed by it or you're going to kick it away. And the one thing that we're going to talk about first here in a minute is the power of your voice. So check in with us on this next episode because we are excited that you guys are with us. We're excited to just give you as much information as we can so that you guys can go and engage. We can't wait to see you on the next one. Talk to you soon.